It's U of L today on 93.9 The Ville. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. And welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Ville. So glad you're joining us today for this show that's about all things U of L. We often have researchers, uh, faculty members from the University of Louisville talking about current topics, students. We have it all here on U of L today with Mark Hebert. So for the next 30 minutes or so, we'll be uh, talking to a couple of folks from the University of Louisville. Hope you'll stick with us uh, for the next 30 minutes. Coming up in the second half of the show, the University of Louisville's Business School is collaborating with WBNA TV on a program that's the local version of Shark Tank. Louisville entrepreneurs pitch their products, devices, and ideas to a group of potential investors, and you'll hear about it and how you might be able to get involved. But first, Gennaro Vito is a professor and chair of the Criminal Justice Department at the University of Louisville. He's studied issues surrounding the death penalty in Kentucky and analyzed data of polling on the death penalty subject. So he's here with us now to talk about some of that polling data. Gennaro, welcome. Good to see you. you. Thank you. Good to be here. All right. Well, tell us a little bit right off the top about uh, death penalty in Kentucky and what the public's views are. What, when was this? Just give me this, the general stuff. Yeah. When was this survey taken and what in general did it show? And we'll get into uh, some more this details. This survey was taken in uh, uh, 2016 from March 4th to April 30th. It was part of uh, UK's Kentucky survey that they, they do. Uh, questions were asked about the death penalty. Um, and uh, th- we've been doing death penalty polls for over 27 years, not every year, but mm-hmm. uh, like a, a series. This is our fifth survey that we've done, and results have been consistent over over time. Uh, well, how, how did U of U- L get involved in this survey that was taken by UK? Well, I've done work on capital sentencing, uh, and then uh, Father Pat Delahanty from Kentucky Coalition Against the Death Penalty asked me if I would analyze uh, survey data uh, over the years. Okay, so, so that's how we, so that's how U of L and you got involved right. with the anal- involved analyzing that. this data of the survey. What, what right. does survey show in general terms right off the top? Well, what does the survey show? The Kentuckians favor life without parole over the death penalty. Uh, that's been consistent over time, over all five surveys. Uh, and the last poll that was uh, uh, 64% of the respondents uh, supported replacing the death penalty for a sense of life without parole. But the, top, but the top line, the first question you asked, though, was do you support the death penalty? Yeah, that was 69%, but then it, it goes down to 64 or uh, Then it flip-flops and goes 64 when you add life without parole. I mean, that's been consistent. Even among the death penalty supporters, the ones that answered yes to the original question, uh, it, uh, they go to 42% support for the death penalty. They'd rather have life without parole as well. If you throw that in there as an, as an option. As an option, yes. Right. And uh, the polling results, mm-hmm. and I'm looking at them right now, showed that um, those who were ju- just asked the question, are you in favor or yes. opposed to the death penalty, 15% are strongly against the death penalty, 33% are strongly in favor of. Right. So I, is it safe to assume that that one-third of Kentuckians who are strongly in favor of the death penalty do not favor? They're not the ones that are saying that I, I would rather keep an inmate in jail for forever, in prison forever, rather than putting them on death row? Well, we didn't break it down that way. We just took supporters. So whether they strongly or, or just generally support, but they do switch. And has, they do switch. have those numbers changed over the years? No. Any of those numbers? No. I mean, the... The uh, uh, death penalty support has always weakened when they when they gave them the option of life without parole. Uh, it's like the average uh, level of death penalty support because this year was kind of a peak. I mean, the last time we did it, uh, uh, people uh, there was 39 percent in favor of the death penalty, 53 percent of uh, long-term sentence like life without parole. Um, and over the years, it's been fifty-two uh, percent support for life without parole. All right, we're talking with Gennaro Vito, who's with the uh, Department of Criminal Justice at the University of Louisville. He's the chair of that department and a professor, and he has analyzed data from a uh, well over the years, I guess, from the death penalty surveys that have been right. been put out there. What does it tell you that Kentuckians favor the death penalty uh, with or without the option of life without parole um, over? folks in other states, Americans it's, uh, in general. It's a little bit higher than the latest Gallup poll. I mean, uh, we were at 69%. Gallup poll was at 60. Uh, 
but it's down over the past two decades. I mean, in Kentucky or in every, yeah, nationwide. Or nationwide. Nationwide. Well, how about in Kentucky? Is Kentucky's it fairly uh, steady, this, right? This went this went up a bit. I think the last time we did it, it was like sixty-two percent. So the number of Kentuckians who, again, just asked that first top line question: right. Do you favor or oppose the death penalty? That percentage has gone up over the years. No, no, it's it's been fairly steady. Okay. And then the second question, do you favor when you, when you throw in the option of uh, life without parole for murderers, um, then how is that percentage? The, the opinion changes, yeah. Right, the, the opinion changes. Death but, penalty support goes down. Right, but has that stayed steady? Has that yes. number stayed it's steady like over fi- the years, too? Like I said, it's 52% over the six year, oh, five years. And where is the death penalty right now in the state of Kentucky? Um, we've, we've, uh, th- there have been three... Um, uh, men who, since 19, what, 76, I guess it was, since we reinstated the death penalty, three men that have been executed yeah. since then. But it's on hold in the courts right now uh, because of some problems, correct? Yes. Uh, there's been some problems with methods of execution uh, that, have, that have held up uh, executions in Kentucky and elsewhere because uh, there's debate over uh, use of the drugs that they have. Even availability of the drug has been a problem. But, you know, death sentences have gone down um, since 1978 in the state. I mean, we had 46. That was the peak between 78 and 89. 46 what? 46 what you... death sentences. Okay. And then That were on death row. That, they, they were on, now, now, some of these figures, you're counting the same person twice because they had an appeal and then they were reconvicted. And, uh, and then from 90 to 99, it was 28 death sentences. From 2000 to 2010, 18, and since 2010, only three. The Kentucky juries have convicted someone and, 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 and recommended a sentence of death. Yes. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's because the poll results are, are that tells me the poll results are right, uh, that the, the juries are rejecting the death sentence and, and sentencing to something else, a life without parole. Is there a concern, you think, or do the survey results reflect a concern that uh, you might be convicting or juries might be convicting innocent people yes, yes, and sentencing was, them to death? That was one of the, the questions we asked, and it was like almost 72% said the respondents agreed that the death penalty risks executing the innocent. And another, uh, um, another high percentage said uh, they're worried that uh, the death penalty should not be uh, – imposed because of problems with its administration. And that was even among death penalty supporters. So you've got yes. some death penalty supporters in yes. there who are saying the same thing, that they're worried that yeah. there could be innocence. So how do, how do people square that um, in their minds when they say, well, yeah, there's a possibility you could execute an innocent guy, but I'm still in favor of the death penalty? Yeah, I, I'm not sure how they justify that, but uh, one of the things that's happened over time nationwide is we've had 156 exonerations, persons on death row that were, were found to be uh, not guilty. Uh, so uh, I think that's in people's minds as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, after all, the, the governor of Illinois at one time, uh, you know, commuted all the death sentences for, because of the problems in that state and, and to life without parole and, and even released some people from death row. So there have been cases where, where uh, that's been a problem, and, that, and people know that. We've got Gennaro Vito from U of L's Criminal Justice Department with us uh, here in the studio, and he's talking about the results of a survey about the death penalty in the state of Kentucky and what are folks' views, uh, Kentuckians' views on the death penalty and offering uh, life without parole instead of the death penalty in uh, some of these murder cases. I did have a question about uh, the cost. Um, that was one of the questions mm-hmm. I think on the survey, as I recall. What did you? What was the question? And how did you frame it, and what was the response? Well, it was 68% of the responses supported a sentence of life uh, without, rather than execution due to the high cost. Uh, and that's been another con- uh, issue among conservatives. I mean, that's kind of um, uh, appealed to them, people who support. There's a problem with cost, and the problem combining with the problem again about innocence, I think that's led uh, conservatives to question the use of the death penalty. So are there more, from a political view, political standpoint, are there more conservatives now in the state of Kentucky and perhaps nationwide 
that are opposed to the death penalty because of the cost and the possibility of uh, executing an innocent person? I'd say yes. That's been one of the, those are the things that have influenced their opinion. But there's still high support among conservatives. I mean, we had uh, over 80 percent of the people said they were conservative, supported the death penalty. So uh, not a surprise there. Yeah. But then they, it does. whenever you add life without parole, the opinion changes. When we're talking about cost, when I looked, when I was a reporter, I remember doing a couple stories on this. As I recall, the cost for incarcerating someone in a Kentucky prison was around $20,000 a year, mm-hmm. ballpark. Um, that may have changed a, a little bit. And the cost of uh, executing a person from the time that they are found guilty and you know go through all the appeals and eventually get to execution, I think was around $2 million in, in the state of Kentucky, or that was the estimate. Is that... Are those ballpark figures? Yeah, those, are ball, right? those are ballpark figures. But the big part of the cost comes at the front end with the trial because death penalty trials are longer. It takes longer to support to, uh, to pick a jury. Uh, it takes longer to uh, death qualify the jury uh, where, you know, basically they ask them, would you, uh, would you never issue a death sentence no matter what was done? And, right. And the Supreme Court's rule, they can be excluded for that reason. And then you have a two-part trial. You have the penalty phase, and if the person's found guilty, then you have a sentencing phase. So it's a much longer trial, and much more involved, and that's uh, that's probably the most costly part of it. How many people are on death row in Kentucky right now? I uh, think around thirty. Around thirty. Yeah. So that's fewer. Yeah. So yeah, some have fewer. obviously died yes. or, or been right. exonerated. Um, and so if those are you know thirty people. Twenty grand a year. What are you talking about? Six hundred thousand yeah. dollars a year to keep folks on death row. Is that about? I think that's right? about right. It, you know, death penalty incarceration is a little bit long, a um, little more expensive because it's solitary confinement. Uh, so it's it's a separate wing of the prison, and you've got to maintain that. So there is some substantial cost involved. Of course, when you look at life without, uh, that's not going to be uh, terribly less less expensive either. But uh, that just for the incar- but that's just for the incarceration part. Like I said, the big part of the cost comes from the trial. Right. Did the poll ask folks who were opposed to the death penalty to give a reason why, their main reason why did it say, you know, moral, moral reasons, cost, uh, yeah. worried about, I mean, did, did you go down yes, the list? Yes, exe- you know, like I said, executing the innocent, the right. cost. So, so what was the big reason that folks who were against the death penalty gave for being opposed to it? The, th- the big thing was it risks uh, executing the, the innocent. That came in at 72%. Oh, wow. So that was by far the most. Right. So, um, so people were are really concerned about that. And like I said, they've got, it's not just a theoretical question anymore. We have cases where it's been a problem. Do you talk about these cases in your classes that you teach at U of Well, usually, unfortunately, I don't teach capital punishment course <laughs> for a while, uh, but uh, I do when I'm when I'm called upon to do it. Yeah, I do talk about it. We do have a course on capital punishment. And, and what is the, the gist of that course? I mean, you're the chair of the department. I mean, what's the gist of that course? Well, we go through the whole process, explain, explain how it works. We look at landmark cases that have guided the death penalty uh, uh, process. Uh, uh, a lot of times, I, I, I try. I have speakers come in. I have a prosecutor come in. I have a defense attorney come in. I'll have a judge come in. Even a federal judge uh, came in one time, and uh, and then I have the students write a position paper after they've read materials and heard everything, and say, you know, do you support the death penalty? If so, why? Are you against the death penalty? If so, why? You know, how does this jive with what you've studied? So get them to do some critical thinking. Do you have a lot of students and just people you talk to in general who say, I'm against the death penalty, but you know what? If someone came into my house and killed my kid, <laughs> it might not be so easy to be against the death penalty. Yeah, but a, a, lot, of your, uh, a lot of your people against the death penalty, there are uh, uh, groups uh, of uh, victims, you know, family victims, and you'd be surprised how many of them do not support the death penalty or not vengeful. Uh, they, they feel like... Uh, their loved one wouldn't support that, and it didn't reflect the purpose of their life. And uh, so that changes from uh, from time to time. But uh, I was surprised by that when I would talk to these groups or listen to them speak. They're a lot more forgiving, I think, than I would be, probably. Yeah, uh, well, it, it, it would be very difficult. You know, it would be difficult. And, you know, 
the problem with being against the death penalty is there's always some kind of heinous case that you know where the person seems to deserve it. But you know, serial murderers like Ted Bundy and didn't get it. You know, he he was executed. Uh, but Dahmer in in uh, Wisconsin, they didn't have a death penalty, so he wasn't sentenced to it. So, but with with things going on today with terrorism and uh, assassination of police officers, and and also some of the shootings that uh, the, the police have done, um, the opinion's going to be, I think, affected by that. Yeah, I think so too. Do you think anything is going to happen in the Kentucky legislature anytime soon to well, it, abolish it, the death penalty? It, realistically, it, it hasn't to this point. So I, I, I suspect that it that it won't, especially given uh, the shift toward the Republican Party and conservatives. Uh, but I, like I said, there's there are two the cost and the innocence are things that ring a bell with conservatives as well, and uh, uh, I think. I think the cost has finally hit home. All right. Gennaro Vito from UofL's Criminal Justice Department. Appreciate you being on. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you talking for to us about the death penalty. It's an okay. interesting topic. I could talk all day about this stuff. <laughs> Van Klaus is an endowed chair in the entrepreneurship program at the College of Business, and he's here to talk about a new television venture for the University of Louisville, as well as the entrepreneurship program in general at the University of Louisville. Welcome, Van. Thank you, you, Mark. Great to be with you. Great to be back. All right. Well, tell us about uh, U of L getting in the TV business, the College of Business getting in the TV business here. Tell us about it. Well, WBNA approached us a, a couple months ago to partner with them on a program that they produce called Dream Funders. This is what I call a kinder, gentler version of Shark Tank. <laughs> Uh, we want to help entrepreneurs link up with investors, but many of the entrepreneurs that come in to pitch, it's their first time pitching their idea in any format. So we do a couple of things. Prior to actually shooting an episode, we bring them in for what we call the Dirty Baby uh, presentation where they present and we coach them how to, to present, provide information that investors are interested in. And then usually a week or two later, they come in, and this is where we're actually filming. And this is the partnership with WBNA. So Suzanne Bergmeister, myself, and then Sharon Handy, who's in charge of our promotions in the college business, we are there for all of the events, but we're not actually participating when the event is shot. We come in later, and in fact, we did the post-production last night on this, where Suzanne Bergmeister, myself, and then we brought in the president of our entrepreneurship club, Colton Payne, a current student. So we serve as kind of the, the experts doing the halftime analysis. So they'll pitch to us, they'll ask us suggestions we have for the team, uh, what they can improve on, what they you know didn't do that would be important for investors. And then we also have scattered throughout the program uh, some promo piece, pieces for the Entrepreneurship MBA program. And all this is going to be on TV, so... It will be. WBNA airs the first episode on uh, November 30th, and that'll be at 8 o'clock. And that station is, if you regular TV, it's TV 21 or Time Warner Cable Channel 916. Okay. So these episodes will run throughout uh, the season, and then they'll repeat them throughout the week on different outlets. So if Mark Hebert has this brilliant idea, this product that I've developed, and I want to try and figure out a way to, to sell it and to pitch it, folks, I come, I, I call you up or I call WBNA. What do I do to, to get on the program? Well, it's, it's real easy. Just go to dreamfunders.com, and there's a sign-up sheet there to sign up to be a presenter, and then they will arrange the schedule. They'll bring you in at a, a certain time. We'll do the, you know, the Ugly Baby uh, coaching session. And then the, we typically schedule two nights of the week. We'll bring in about half the presenters one night, half the other night. And so a presenter could be there from, say, 6.30 till 10.30 while we're uh, presenting that night. We have a green room for them so they can sit with the other entrepreneurs. We have some snacks for them. And then when they come into the uh, room where they present, uh, we, we help coach them with that. Uh, if they make any, you know, mistakes, we can stop the taping, give them a chance to go back. So while it's a fun environment, it also could be high pressure for an entrepreneur. But we want to make it as easy as possible for them to communicate their idea to the panel of investors. It's normally four or five experienced investors from the Louisville community who will ask them questions, and we hope a deal gets struck at the end. Uh, it could be something like, 
uh, a loan that the, the entrepreneur is seeking. It could be an equity investment. In some cases, it might just be they're looking for advice, so it could be a strategic partnership that could be followed up with an investment at a later point in time. The other nice thing for the entrepreneurs is when people watch this show, they learn about the entrepreneurs and their ventures. So it might be a great uh, conduit for additional customers, other investors. So it's really our way at the College of Business and the Entrepreneurship MBA program to help promote entrepreneurship in the community. We're talking with Van Klaus from uh, U of L's Entrepreneurship Program in the College of Business, and we're talking about right now about the Dream Funders Program that uh, we've partnered with between U of L and WBNA TV. And the the folks that are coming in from the community to kind of be the judges, for lack of a better term, it, it, you said it's a kinder, gentler Shark Tank. Is there a Mark Cuban in there that uh, you know is going to really pump them and say, "No, that that's not going to work. You, your investment strategy isn't correct," or or, or like that? Or are they pretty? Uh, you the ones that you've taped so far have they been? pretty nice and accommodating and said kind of giving them tips on what they should be saying yeah. well you know part of shark tanks appeal is the confrontational environment uh, we will have our investors talk with the entrepreneurs about what would not work about their concept but they just don't do it in such a confrontational manner because we don't want our presenters to feel on the defensive the whole time uh, and we do want it to be developmental for these entrepreneurs, too, because many of them, it's their very first time ever pitching their idea to anyone. Of the ones that you've seen and that have taped so far, has there been any one or two of the products or devices or whatever that really stuck out and you said, you know what, that, that guy's got a good idea? Yeah, I think there are a number of them. Uh, they still need some development, but a couple of the presenters already have issued patents. Uh, they're looking for ways to commercialize the product. In many cases, they're looking for partnerships to help them with manufacturing, uh, help them with branding advice, uh, marketing advice. So there are a number of concepts that, that I think could actually be real businesses in the short term. Then there are others that are a little more de developmental. The entrepreneur may have a, a great uh, recipe you, for co cookies or cakes. Can, can you give me an example of one that you that you really struck you and said, this guy's got a really good idea, yeah. or this woman's got a really good idea? Well, this, this woman came in with her two daughters, and she has experience in medical device sales. So he, she has a product called Pole Toppers. Uh, I think the name could be a little bit better, <laughs> but essentially she places characters from cartoons on the top of IV poles and would sell them into hospital systems to help make it a little bit lighter environment when you're, you know, you go into a hospital room, especially for children. Uh, she had already sold a number of them. Uh, she has an issued patent, but she ran into manufacturing problems. So she was back with this iteration of her business, trying to, to really jump start it again, looking for manufacturing help primarily. And one of our investors talked about the contacts he has in Louisville, he can put them in touch with people, and he also suggested that, you know, if they can create those relationships, he would be interested in investing in them. Very good. All right. Well, let's, I'll give you a chance to repitch the show and how to get on it here and when we wrap up. But let's go to the entrepreneurship program at the University of Louisville. What is entrepreneurship? In our particular program, we want our students to, to develop an action-oriented innovation mindset. That means that no matter the setting, whether it's an independent startup that you're interested in pursuing, if you're currently working for Humana and you want to continue in that career but you want to be more involved on the innovation side of what Humana is doing or GE or any other large established company, or it could be a not-for-profit, a government agency. So we help them learn what innovation is in all those different settings. We give them tools and techniques that they practice while they're in the program, so it's really a, a no-risk environment. They're not putting their, you know, venture idea out there in front of the public until they're well-groomed to be able to do so. And we have some of our students that come out of the program with businesses that they're ready to launch. We have others that continue in their corporate jobs or their not-for-profit jobs, but they're helping their organization innovate in ways that the organization may not have thought about previously. We're talking with Van Klaus from the Entrepreneurship Program at the University of Louisville and the College of Business. What are some of the folks who have come out of the program, particularly out of the MBA Entrepreneurship Program, 
uh, that have gone on to form their own companies and had some success uh, with their own businesses? Well, our, our latest success story is InScope Medical Solutions. It was a four-person team. One person came through the MBA from the medical school. She's a full professor, Mary Nan Mallory, and she just wanted to learn business techniques to help her in her job. But when she came into our program, we teamed her with three younger students who really were gung-ho, they were competitive, they had a drive to be successful with their own business, and they came up with an innovation for an emergency room. Uh, they came up with a new iteration on a laryngoscope, which is the device that's used in an emergency situation or any surgery to help insert a breathing tube so the patient can be put to sleep but still be able to breathe on a machine effectively. So it's, it's widely used. It's used in ambulances, air ambulances, mobile ambulances, so a wide number of settings. They identified the problem with the current laryngoscope. Uh, Mary Nan did that with her chief residents in the emergency room one night. And they developed a new way to combine two separate techniques into one technique which will vastly improve the amount of time it takes to insert the laryngoscope so they can get a breathing tube so the patient can be breathing. Quicker and easier way to take these emergency patients That's and, right. and put them under, basically. Um, we hear at times that Louisville's not a great place to be able to get funding. If you're an entrepreneur or someone starting up a business, it's, it's tough in Louisville, Kentucky getting funding. Do you find that to be the case, or is Louisville developing an entrepreneurship culture where people are willing to invest in some of these local startups? Yeah. We have an excellent entrepreneurship culture here in Louisville. It's one of the best I've seen in the country, and I travel all around the country to other schools that host competitions that mm -hmm. our teams go to, so I'm pretty familiar with all the cultures. We're not Silicon Valley. We're not going to be, you know, the Boston Innovation mm -hmm. Hub, but for a city our size where we're located, I think we have an excellent ecosystem. And we have many investors that we call angel investors who might invest up to $100,000 in a business. And then we have a group of first stage venture capitalists that might invest, you know, 250000 maybe up to almost a million. Where Louisville is lacking is with that next stage of development. When the company ha is up and going, they have sales, they're ready to do expansion when they made even another 5 or $10 million from venture capitalists, those resources are not as readily available. But those first stage investors know people in other places, Silicon Valley, uh, the Northeast, that can invest. So if the concept is good enough, it has good traction in the market, a good customer base, and it's poised for major growth, they can be placed with investors who are willing to make that next stage investment. So take the entrepreneurship program at the University of Louisville, enroll there, get all you need to start a business, and then uh, go on our Shark Tank like uh, Dream Funder show with WBNA, right? <laughs> yes, or become a corporate innovator there in you your go. current job. All right, one last time, uh, some information about WBNA. If folks want to perhaps come on the program and pitch their product, how do they get a hold of you or WBNA? Okay. If you just do a Google search, just type in Dream Funders Louisville, the website will come up. You can then go to the website. You'll be able to see some of some videos of previous pitches they have there. And then you can sign up to be a presenter. It's a fairly short application, basic information. Then WBNA will contact you and arrange for you to come in and get some basic training and presentation and then make your pitch. Very good. Well, good luck with the program. Thank Appreciate you, Mark. It, man. Thanks for being on. All right. We always wrap up the program with a little tidbit about the University of Louisville. So did you know... This is the seventh straight year that UofL has been named a military-friendly university by militaryfriendly.com, and UofL has also been named a top school for veterans. So good words for the University of Louisville and the, and the vets in our community. Uh, thanks for listening to UofL Today with Mark Hebert, which airs every Monday and Tuesday night at 6 and Saturday and Sunday mornings on 93.9 The Ville. Again, thanks for listening, and go Cards! <laughs>